Hello. We've reached chapter 7 of my book, Philosophizer's Bible, and I'm going to read that out in a minute. But I just remembered that in an earlier video I said I would say a little bit about my Filofax notebooks, um, because it's one of the ways in which I work. It's only one of the ways. But I carry a, a little leather folder around with me which has Filofax paper in it. Actually, I made the holes myself because it's cheaper. And um, <clears throat> I've started a new notebook. You'll recognize this from the book cover. And it has just 11 pages in it. Started it in February. Actually, I might read out what I wrote a couple of days ago. It's only very short. So that's the way that's the way that looks. And this is seven years' work. See the thickness there. Um, not a lot for seven years, you know, because I um, I don't write every day. Sometimes a week or two weeks goes by without me actually writing anything. Then an idea comes, I write it down, and so on. But that's where all every just about every um, useful thought has come from. The first thing that happened was I wrote it down in my notebook. And when students ask me, you know, what should I do? How do I, how do I keep a notebook, etc.? I did once use hardback notebooks, and you know, you buy one of these really expensive, not necessarily leather bound, but you know, beautifully bound notebook, etc. And then on the third or fourth day, you write something really stupid, and then you're faced with the choice: well, do I actually tear a page out? Do I keep it? Do I what? Um, it's agonising much easier just to do it on loose leaf paper because you can always chuck a sheet away you know if you've if you've said something really stupid or you've messed it up in some way just throw it away uh, or you can even rearrange the sheets if they're you know for some purpose um, in my case i have notes on other things as other things besides philosophy uh, website development photography etc so those go into separate binders um, the thing i showed you just has my philosophy notes, so there are other filofaxes as well with notes on other topics. Um, yes, the other thing I was going to say was there are 15 pages of quite important notes that I've actually put online on my Philosophizer's Bible blog on Blogspot. Just put in Philosophizer's Bible blogspot.com and click on notebook and they're all there you just um, click to enlarge the images and so you can read the thoughts as they came originally and there are some thoughts there that I never that never actually reached the book and looking at it now I think oh I should have followed that up I should have maybe gone more in that direction but who knows maybe I'll you know those are leads that I might follow up in the future so yeah that's that's what i wanted to say about that so today i'm going to read the chapter called the swimmer and in it i criticize wittgenstein and there was a time when it was like um almost heresy to criticize wittgenstein now every every philosopher is doing it so there's nothing remarkable in that at all but he did say that bad philosophy is nourished on a diet of bad examples and this is a particular case where his example isn't quite, doesn't work quite the way he intended. So anyway, let us begin. The Swimmer. How long can you hold your breath? Quote, as Wittgenstein observed, thinking is like swimming underwater. We must struggle against our natural buoyancy to reach down to the depth of a problem." Unquote. That's Roy A. Sorensen, Thought Experiments, 1998. What does it mean to go deep in philosophy? Why is it so hard? Somewhere, I think in his autobiography, Bertrand Russell made a similar point when he confessed that he was able to do real thinking, quote unquote, only a few minutes at a time. 
The rest of the time you spend at your desk scribbling or typing away, or silently cogitating, or in debate with other philosophers. You're just shuffling words around like counters on a board. I know what Russell was talking about, because I've done it too. My thoughts have been so well rehearsed before I actually get round to putting the words down on paper, it's sometimes a struggle to hold on to the original vision that the words were intended to express. Like Russell, I live for those few minutes as of when I can find them. Here's another quote from a movie. Racing is just life. Everything else is just waiting, unquote. That's Steve McQueen in Le Mans, 1971, uh, the greatest racing movie ever made. Instead of motor racing, McQueen could have easily been talking about what we thinkers do when we philosophize, the thing we live for. Having said that, as the reader will already have guessed, I'm not on the same page as Wittgenstein and Russell when it comes to the question of what real thinking is like, or rather, what it is about, not at all. It isn't just about being original in thinking up new concepts or combinations of ideas or arguments. For sure, the great majority of academic philosophers lack the originality of a Wittgenstein or a Russell. But the same could be said of a great chess player. You can get good, very good, by long hours of study and developing your powers of calculation. But only a relative few have that extra ability to see deeply into a position on a chessboard, grasp it intuitively, discover possibilities that were barely latent in the placement of the pieces, possibilities that only very few can see. Morphy, Capablanca, Tal, Fisher, Carlson, the list is not that long. By contrast, there are currently around 1,500 FIDE registered chess grandmasters. As great as it is, possibly the greatest of all games, the game of chess is a mundane activity. The world of a chessboard is a world bounded by strict rules, a world which, for all the incredible variety of possibilities that it generates, there are said to be more possible chess positions than atoms in the universe, is just more and more and more of the same. And the same is true of the chess moves that thinkers, even great thinkers, think up when they are pursuing a philosophical problem. I suspect that Wittgenstein never actually swam underwater for real, because it isn't that hard, despite what he says. Certainly not a struggle. Yes, the human body is naturally buoyant, but only to a relatively small degree. Lying still in the water, more than four-fifths of your body is submerged. I had to look that up, but I knew it was, I knew it was something around that unless you are very fat or swimming in the Dead Sea, which is denser than normal seawater on account of its high salt content, then it's difficult. Underwater swimming is a matter of basic technique. I would rate my level of swimming ability as only two steps of a beginner, but I've never experienced any difficulty swimming underwater. It's a knack that's easily learned. This is how you do it. You do a jackknife on the surface, point your head down and kick, and you're on the way to the bottom of the swimming pool or lake. Try it, you might be surprised. Flippers help if you're diving down more than a few feet, but they are not essential. Ditto for mask and snorkel. Other issues arise for deep sea divers, which we needn't go into and which Wittgenstein was certainly not thinking about. When Russell talked about moving counters around, he was talking about technique. He was talking about the main activity of academic philosophy as it existed at his time, but the very same applies today. As a philosophy graduate student, you've learned all the logical moves. You've become proficient at it, so proficient in fact, that you are no longer thinking, but merely calculating, going through the motions. Sit in on any philosophy seminar, and that's mostly what you'll hear. It sounds difficult and profound only because you haven't mastered the relevant techniques, the vocabulary and the logic of this particular problem area. 
If the participants are lucky enough to have a real thinker sitting at the table, someone close to the calibre of a Russell or a Wittgenstein, say, then the discussion has a chance of moving on, a rare enough event. Wittgenstein's simile of the underwater swimmer is exactly the right image for what I'm talking about, the trials of the philosophizer. What I disagree with completely is its application. I do think that this was something Wittgenstein was wrong about, plain wrong. Wittgenstein the thinker twists himself into ever tighter knots, strains and struggles to think deeply, but that was never the real challenge. The hard thing, the really hard thing with swimming underwater is getting over your fear of suffocation. The fear that prevents you from going ever deeper, exploring the rocks right down there while the increasing quantity of carbon dioxide in your lungs is beginning to make your head feel dizzy and your diaphragm ache. And knowing all the while that the deeper you go, the longer it will take to get back to the surface. Fear and panic. That's what philosophizing is like. You've gone down a little way, maybe feeling quite pleased with yourself, but you know you can see how much further you could go if you made the effort then the fear kicks in. There is no technique for overcoming the fear. The army doesn't try to make the cowards amongst its new recruits more courageous. It weeds them out. They fail the aptitude test. Sadly, the same does not apply to the student intake in the average university department of philosophy. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's true. They're a bunch of cowards. A lot of them. And they choose the academic life because, what can I say, the challenges are less um, extreme. They have a cushy life. Nice meals, hot meals, etc. And um, for all the, um, what can I say, the, uh, the controversy that, that rages in particular academic disciplines, um, no one's ever hurt by it. Um, they're all so polite to one another. That's the one thing I'm, you know, that really gets gets my back up. Um, they have such an easy life, basically. And I'm not one of those people saying that oh well they should just close down all you know universities or departments of philosophy or whatever. But I think they should. Uh, there should be more variety in the work they are required to do, apart from just teaching undergraduates or, or uh, supervising graduate students. They should be made to go out into the real world and do stuff, whatever it is. Um, but yes, uh, intellectual ability isn't the most important thing. Obviously your brain has got to have, has got to be reasonably efficient, but it's the moral qualities. I don't use the word moral because that's, um, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in morals, but courage, uh, the, the qualities that are not um, the qualities of a calculating machine, but the qualities of a human being. Those are the ones that really matter. And uh, I wish that this was more emphasized. You know, when students go to go up to university, I think they should um, they should get a little bit more of that. Made to be made to realize that it's not just it's not just a game it's just not not just mental exercises it's something challenging and real and scary and you need to have a little bit of courage to do it that's all I have to say today see you soon bye <laughs>